thank you very much for coming out. I'm uh, really excited to talk to you about a topic that I find uh, incredibly fascinating, which is generative artwork or writing programs uh, that generate artwork. I think it's uh, particularly interesting for programmers because it sort of takes that mindset that we all developed when we learned how to program and it applies it to an analysis of the, the visual world around us and also to how we can create uh, visual artwork. So um, to give you a little bit of background about myself, I'm a, I have a traditional programming background. I have a degree in computer science. I worked for many years on an open source distributed database called Apache Cassandra. Uh, some of you may have used that, and uh, I apologize for any <laughs> bugs that you hit. You can blame them on me. Uh, but I've always really loved artwork. I've always loved uh, painting and drawing. And so a few years ago, I decided uh, to try and take artwork a little bit more seriously. And I looked around to figure out what skills I could bring to bear on my artwork, and programming was sort of the most obvious option for me. So I kind of stumbled my way into the world of generative artwork. I didn't even really know that it existed at the time. But uh, I got obsessed with it, and I kept making it over and over again. And a few years later now, I've made maybe 500 pieces of generative artwork, and uh, I was lucky enough to switch over to being uh, an, art an artist full time earlier this year. And uh, as an aside, I have to say, uh, programming artwork is way, way more fun than programming a database. Um, <laughs> it's, there's, uh, there's no bug trackers. There's no code reviews. Nobody's nitpicking my variable names or white space. Um, zero tests. I've literally never written a test. Uh, no documentation. No daily stand-ups. Um, I hate standing up in the morning. I would much rather just program. So basically, generative artwork, it, it takes all the, the fun, exciting parts of programming, and uh, it doesn't have any of the parts that you get paid for. So uh, artists just don't get paid. That's the way it is. But to give you an idea of uh, the sort of artwork that I make, um, I'll just show you a few images. Uh, these are just a couple of my favorites. These are fairly recent. I think both of these are from um, last year and a couple more from this year. Um, so like most generative artists, I'm starting from sort of a blank canvas here. I'm not doing uh, data visualization. There's no data set that I'm working with here. I'm not doing any sort of image processing. I'm just writing a program that needs to draw something interesting. and um, uh, I, don't, I also don't use any like Photoshop or Illustrator or anything like that. It's done exclusively through programming. So this is my, my recent work, but when I got started, uh, I created the kind of work that you might expect somebody with a programming and computer science background to create. It was very uh, geometric, very obviously mathematically inspired, and I felt like uh, it needed something else. I felt like I could take it a little bit further by introducing more organic, uh, natural elements to the artwork. And to me, the best way to do that was to go out and actually study the natural world around me. So I grabbed my camera, I went outside, and I looked for things that I found aesthetically appealing, but that I thought I could maybe take a stab at reproducing uh, with a generative process. And so I did a few studies. Um, these are a couple of them. Uh, on the left, this is of a field of kind of dry, dormant grass. On the right, it's a, a wooden fence board. And these are the, this is the generative artwork, uh, or output, not the uh, original photograph. And when I did these studies, I, I tried to reproduce it as carefully as I could, trying to capture all of the, the patterns that I could really discern. And I learned a couple of really, really interesting lessons from doing these studies. The first lesson that I learned was uh, the world is insanely mind-bogglingly complex and detailed. I mean, any little portion of it that you really look at closely and study has an immense amount of, of detail in it. It's pretty astounding. But the second lesson that I learned was that despite all that detail and variety, my fairly simple 
generative programs could actually do a reasonably good job of, of reproducing what I saw. And I thought that was pretty interesting, but I kind of realized that the reason for that is this. The world itself is generative. We have laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws of biology, and these are all rule sets that, organize, that, that govern how the matter and the universe is organized. And anytime you have rule sets like that, uh, patterns are naturally going to occur. But if you go out and you actually look around in the natural world, you don't just see uh, clean mathematical patterns or obvious uh, geometric organization. You see a big kind of tangled mess. And that's because there's another side to the universe besides uh, these rules. We, ha we have forces that we perceive as randomness, forces of entropy and uh, chaotic processes. And so the world is really the combination of these two things, the sort of structural element and the sort of random element, and that's where we get a lot of interesting effects. And that puts generative artwork in a really interesting place because computers are really good at both sides of that. On the one hand, it's pretty obvious computers and algorithms are great for describing patterns and processes and organization. But interestingly, on the other hand, computers are excellent at working with randomness. They sort of ironically allow us to be very specific about the kinds of randomness that we want. Any sort of probability distribution that you can think of, you can express, and you basically get a free, endless stream of samples uh, from that distribution. So uh, generative artwork is basically the perfect medium for exploring the intersection of these two things. And I think that makes it a very interesting and, and powerful medium. And that's just one of the reasons why I really love it. I wish I could talk about all the other reasons, but this is the one that I'm going to focus on a little bit today. So when I did these studies, I, I learned an awful lot, but I couldn't really directly apply the patterns that I saw here uh, to artwork that I was creating. It's hard to work a wooden fence board into uh, you know, a painting that you might want to create. So uh, fortunately, I kind of stumbled across something else that was a lot more useful to me. I still love to uh, draw and paint all of the time, and so I was flipping through a sketchbook, and something really stood out to me. It was just a pretty simple, abstract, uh, small watercolor painting. But uh, I looked at the watercolor, and I was really astounded by uh, the, the, the really interesting patterns that you see in the shapes that, that uh, develop there. There's lots of different uh, textures and fine details and uh, variety in the behavior. And I decided I wanted to try to capture some of that with a, with a generative process. And I thought paint was especially nice to try and do this with because it's very abstract and very malleable, right? So I could uh, reshape it to sort of any purpose that I want. And it's very open to interpretation. You know, the viewer can see paint as pretty much any object or even sort of abstract um, uh, emotional uh, qualities. So uh, paint makes sort of an ideal uh, thing to reuse in other generative artwork. So before I dive into my, my generative model of, of how I tried to recreate watercolor paint, I want to make something clear about my, uh, my goals here. So this is a sketch by Rembrandt. And when Rembrandt made this sketch, he ignored about 95% of what he saw. What Rembrandt was really excellent at was picking out the 5% that was really essential to the image and that uh, really defined it to him. And so I'm going to do something similar with watercolor. My goal is not to make something photorealistic or uh, physically accurate uh, simulation but rather to try to extract the essence of it, that 5% that's uh, really characteristic of it and makes it special. And besides uh, kind of focusing on the essential parts, having a simple model has a couple of other upsides. The first is that uh, I want to be able to fully understand uh, this process or algorithm that I'm working with, and I want to be able to fit it all in my working memory. Um, as an artist, you, you really have to know every tool that you work with uh, from the top to the bottom, 
And as a generative artist, your algorithms are your tools, and so you want to understand every aspect of them. The other upside to a really simple model is that I'm not doing a sketch of a single image. I'm doing a sketch of an entire process. And so I want to be able to adjust that process for different uses. I want to be able to tweak the parameters and understand what they're going to do. I want to be able to tweak the algorithm itself. And so uh, uh, basically, my, my process for modeling this watercolor is pretty simple, but I think, it's, I think there's a lot of upsides to that, and it makes it easy to explain to you guys as well. So uh, to look at some actual watercolor paint, this is pretty close to uh, what I'll be basing my model on. So I want you to look pretty carefully at this for just a few seconds. When I looked at this, there were kind of three main characteristics that stood out to me as being essential to the watercolor. And, and by the way, the way I created this was just, I took a brush uh, with just water, dampened the paper, loaded it with paint, painted just a small circle, and uh, waited for it to dry. So when I, when I look at this, uh, there were kind of three big characteristics that stood out. The first is that uh, the paint didn't stay where I painted the small circle. It sort of expanded outward and it deformed a little bit. It's not really a perfect circle anymore. The second is that, pretty obviously, it doesn't have smooth curves around the edges. If y'all can see this all the way in the back, it has a rougher texture. It sort of reminds me of aerial photographs of a shoreline where it has um, sort of a, a fractal nature uh, where parts of it jut in and out. But if you zoom in at the smaller scales, you see the same patterns repeat uh, even down to pretty small scales. And that's especially true of some of the uh, some other uh, watercolor examples I looked at. And the last characteristic that's pretty important is that uh, a lot of the edges are, are still pretty soft here. We see a lot of areas where it blends smoothly from uh, having a lot of pigment all the way out to pure paper. And so those, those kind of three characteristics are what I focused on with my model, having the expansion and distortion, the kind of rough shoreline-like edges, and then having uh, a more smooth, uh, blended transition. So onto the actual model. I'm doing this with uh, processing, which is an open source uh, Java graphics library. It's pretty low level, but I, I kind of like it that way. Uh, but like any good programmer, I hate writing Java, so <laughs> uh, I use a closure wrapper called Quill for it, and I, I highly recommend that. Um, so start out with just this, this very basic polygon, and we're going to first work on doing the sort of expansion and, and deformation of the polygon. And the model for doing that is pretty simple. We're going to walk around and uh, deform one edge at a time, and we're going to just kind of make it jut outward by some amount. So we have to decide exactly how each edge is going to jut out. And there are about, uh, well, there are exactly three variables as to uh, how each edge is going to jut out like that. The first is to kind of pick a starting point in the middle of each edge. And this is where we're going to break the existing edge and then kind of bend it outward. The next variable is, is the angle that we're going to bend that edge outward at. And the last variable is kind of the magnitude of that, that uh, vector, how far out it's going to extend. And uh, when we combine those, we just basically get something like this. But we need to be really careful about how we decide to do this, because it's going to have a really big impact on the sort of effect that we get. And this is where that kind of careful utilization of randomness is really important. So there are a couple of uh, main probability distributions that usually come up when you're working on artwork. The first is the uniform distribution, which almost every programmer has to have used, I'm sure. And obviously, you get sort of a uniform probability of picking a number anywhere within a range. But in the natural world, you don't really see the uniform distribution that often, uh, if ever you see uh, much more frequently the Gaussian distribution, or the normal distribution, also called the bell curve. 
And that's where you specify a mean and an amount of variance, which controls how far away from the mean you might draw your values. And so if you want to get natural effects, uh, the way to go is to go with the Gaussian distribution for things. And so that's exactly what I did here. So for each of these variables, I used a Gaussian distribution. For this one, the mean is centered in the center of the edge, and I might pick values further and further away from that with decreasing probability. For the angle, the mean is perpendicular, but I might have some variance away from being perfectly perpendicular. And for the magnitude, it's sort of a truncated distribution. I only want positive values because it never shrinks inward, only goes outward. But other than that, uh, it's likely to only expand out a short distance, but occasionally I might get parts that stick out quite a bit. So with these uh, nicely tuned uh, distributions, if I run just one round of this on the polygon, I get something that looks a little bit like this. And this is a pretty good start. This gives us uh, kind of that growth and that weird blobby distortion. Uh, and so I think it's time to move on to getting those kind of rough details, the fine tuning. So what I'm going to do is kind of take advantage of that fractal-like nature where you see the same patterns repeating at smaller and smaller scales. And I'm just going to apply this function recursively to the new polygon. And the only thing I have to do is make one small adjustment. When I pick the uh, magnitude variable, uh, I want to scale that by the length of the edge so that as I'm dealing with smaller and smaller edges, uh, it's sticking out less and less each time. So I run this uh, recursively six times, and I suddenly get a lot more detail. And this uh, looks pretty good to me. This reminds me of kind of that, that uh, rough edge texture that I see in a lot of the watercolor paint. So the next step is to start thinking about the soft edges and how we can make things blend a little bit. Normally, when I want to create a sort of blend around a shape, I'll take the polygon and I'll stack a bunch of transparent uh, layers, layers that are nearly uh, transparent, sorry, low opacity. And with each one, I'll just slightly shift them around, and that gives you a pretty good effect. But there's actually something better that we already have on hand here for doing that. This uh, function that we just used to deform the polygon is already really good for making small random changes to a polygon. So what I'm going to do is take advantage of that to get differences in the layers. So here's the basic approach. I take our original starting polygon, and I just run it through three rounds of deformation. So this is six. So with only three, it'll be somewhere in between, not, not all the way uh, fully detailed. And then for each layer, and I'll do about 50 layers, I'll start from that, that base polygon with three rounds, and I'll run it through three more rounds to get all of the fine details. I draw the layer with really low opacity, move on to the next layer. Start again from that same base polygon, run it through three different rounds of deformation, lay down a second layer. So each layer is going to have a lot of really subtle differences, but the, on sort of a macro scale, all parts of the shape are going to be the same. So when we do something like that, uh, we get our nice soft texture here. Unfortunately, processing isn't uh, perfect with really low opacity layers, so you still do see some edges of polygons, and that's just a fact of life. But there's one thing that I want to try and improve about this, and that's the variety in terms of having some parts of the edge be sharp and other parts being a lot softer and a lot more gradual blending transition. This is, a, this is pretty uniformly soft all the way around. Uh, so I want to exaggerate that variation more. So I, I came up with a pretty basic approach for modeling this, and it looks like this. For each edge in the original polygon, we go through and we assign a level of variance. And that's going to control that magnitude variable, how far out that edge uh, will jut. 
And so we can assign these sort of variance levels. And whenever we do break the edge and extend it outward, we create two child edges. And those inherit the variance uh, level with some small amount of variation. So we're going to keep that part of the, the blob sort of consistent in terms of uh, how much variation it is. And the higher variance levels will be softer, and the lower variance levels will have a sharper edge. And you can think of this as maybe being kind of uh, analogous to parts of the paper being more wet than other parts. The wet parts of the paper transport the pigment more readily. The dry parts tend to stop more abruptly. So if we apply our variance change, uh, we get something that looks like this. And this is a lot more uh, satisfying to me. This um, down in the bottom right side, you can see we have some really nice, big, uh, soft transitions. And we still have a few areas that are a little bit more abrupt and a little bit um, sharper boundary. So since I uh, still have a pretty good amount of time, there's one other detail that I snuck into this that uh, I want to talk about. If you look closely, the center of this is slightly more opaque than everything else. I'm not sure how visible that is on the projected screen, but um, that's something you'll see in a lot of natural watercolor. Uh, most of the pigment stays in the center, and so you, you kind of see the remnants of the original shape that you drew a little bit. So to get just a touch of that effect, I did something like this, which is instead of uh, doing all 50 layers the same way where I do three rounds on the base polygon and then three rounds for every single layer, I did something a little bit different. For the first third of the layers, I, only, I created the base polygon with only one round of deformation. So just a, a slight change, and then each layer got three on top of that. And then when I moved on to the second third of the layers, I added one more round to the base polygon, and then did three for each layer on top of that. And then for the final third, uh, I did the full uh, three and three. And so the first third of the, of the layers are going to be closer to the center. And as we keep progressing, we move further and further out. So it kind of concentrates uh, the, the pigment, so to speak, in the center of our blob. And so if you look closely, you see that, that kind of uh, central effect. So that um, pretty much wraps up my model of watercolor paint. Like I said, I kept it pretty simple. Um, but now I have a, a nice tool at my disposal. And I can reuse it in sort of any way that I want to. I've almost created a little bit of a new medium for myself as a generative artist. And that's kind of a cool uh, aspect of generative artwork is it's, it's almost a meta medium. You, sometimes with each piece, you're creating a new uh, medium to create, artwork, to create artwork within. So I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of um, how I've, I've used this. Uh, this was just uh, one of the first really basic pieces that I uh, made with this technique. And I really was interested to see how this uh, responded in terms of different areas of color blending. And they don't always blend really nicely, especially if the colors are uh, very different. Um, the same is true of paint, but uh, it's especially kind of weird uh, doing it through processing. So I had to be careful about what colors I tried to blend. And I did one, one tweak that made the color blending a little bit uh, better, which was to use a, a texture mask um, for each of these blobs. And the texture mask, you can see it kind of looks like a grain on here, like a paper grain. Uh, and that kind of allows each blob to have parts that are more transparent and more opaque. So layers underneath uh, show through a little bit better. And the, the other thing that I did that, that helped out the color blending was instead of doing one blob at a time all the way to completion, then the next blob all the way to completion, I sort of defined all of the blobs up front and then did just the first layer for every blob, and then just the second layer for every blob, and then the third, and so on. So they kind of, the whole thing sort of gets painted at the same time, and that helps to blend the colors a little bit more naturally as well. Uh, eventually, I wanted to make uh, more 
sophisticated pieces with this. So um, these are a couple of uh, finished pieces of artwork that I made using this technique. And uh, here I, I drifted a little bit further away from that more natural watercolor color feel, which is OK. The, the reason that I did the watercolor study was not necessarily to make fake watercolor paintings, uh, but it was to kind of capture that really interesting, uh, those interesting patterns and textures that I uh, saw in watercolor. So these look a little bit, to me, more like maybe fabric dye or something like that. But um, you still keep all these really cool, interesting uh, uh, watercolor-like textures in here. Um, I also introduced a couple of uh, decorative elements, um, introduced some masks on the different layers of watercolor paint. So that's where you see some of the, the lighter lines, where it allows layers below it to show through. But I want to talk just a little bit about uh, how you put together a full generative piece. It's, it, it does resemble a lot how I modeled the uh, watercolor process itself. There's a lot of uh, carefully applied randomness in these. So if I ran the program that generated this one a second time, I would get a pretty different result. And that's by design. Uh, it's, a, it's a careful balancing act when you're working with randomness and generative artwork. You, you want those pleasant surprises that come from using randomness. You want it to do things that maybe you couldn't think of yourself or that you didn't expect or that are really off the wall. It's, it's really amazing for that type of exploration. But uh, you don't want it to only do something pleasant every 2,000 images. Uh, you want it to do something pleasant every maybe 10 or 20 images. So you try to find this system of constraints around the randomness or this sort of structure uh, that makes it more likely to produce interesting things. And determining exactly what that structure is is different for every piece and is usually the most challenging part of designing a piece of artwork. But um, it's what makes generative artwork a really fun uh, way to work for me. So um, let me see how much time I've got here. OK. So this is pretty much. Um, Everything that I have to say about the watercolor process and um, about how I've kind of applied it to a few pieces of artwork. And since we have some time and people usually uh, have no idea what generative artwork is about, I want to go ahead and open it up for questions. But um, before I do, thank you very much, everybody, for having me out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so questions. Uh, we're not going to use a mic, so just speak loudly. I'll make sure to repeat whatever you ask. And I think there was a question up front. Yeah, do you mostly work with uh, static images and processing, or do you utilize some of this more like animation, dynamic features in your work? So yeah, so the question was, do I mainly work with static images and processing, or do I take advantage of some of the animation uh, features of it? I, I do occasionally use um, animation, but so far, I've only focused on uh, static imagery because it's, it's already such a, a new, difficult thing to do. Um, adding dimensions of, of, of time uh, just complicates things infinitely. I mean, literally, you're adding an infinite dimension to the work. Uh, and uh, it's hard enough for me to make um, static 2D imagery uh, and, and I feel like it'll be a long time before I've uh, sort of mastered that in any sense. And so uh, I, I do play with uh, animation some, but for now I'm, I'm focusing on what I can learn just through static 2D imagery. Thank you. Another question. Yes. Um, sure. Save your work and can we see some code? Okay, so the questions were, uh, how do I save my work and can you see some code? Uh, so um, I save my work through uh, seeds, seeds for the random number generator. Um, I think everybody in here probably knows what a seed is, uh, so I won't explain that. But um, every time I update the program and rerun it, I use a new seed, and I save the seed as part of the file name. And so that way, uh, if I want to uh, 
uh, generate a much larger image, I can just rerun the program uh, with different size settings and uh, use the seed. And that'll mostly work. Uh, there are some gotchas there, but I, I won't go into detail on those. Um, so other than that, I just save images as uh, just TIFF images, which are uh, nice for printing. Uh, can you see some code? Um, you can see some code. So uh, on my uh, website, which is nicely listed right there, I have blog posts. I specifically have a blog post about the watercolor um, approach, and it shows code in there. Um, I don't open source all of my work. That's kind of a, that's a long topic that I won't get into here, um, but I'm happy to talk with anybody about that afterwards. Um, did that answer your questions? Awesome. Yes. Sure. So the question is, have I learned anything about uh, water and the sort of uh, ways that water distorts things and kind of the physical processes by uh, doing this, um, this type of study? So I, I did uh, read a little bit about uh, fluid dynamics, um, which kind of fell into the realm of being too complicated for me. It kind of... Uh, you know, I talked about I want it to be simple. I want to understand everything uh, from the top to the bottom. And to do that with fluid dynamics would take me a really long time. And I didn't, I didn't care that much about having physically um, accurate simulation. On the other hand, uh, it taught me something about uh, watercolor painting, uh, the actual process of, of using watercolor paint. When you observe things with this uh, very um, uh, process-oriented mindset, this very analytical mindset, uh, it's interesting, you learn a lot, a lot more uh, sort of in the reverse direction as well. So by doing this sort of generative work, my, my actual watercolor paintings have gotten um, a lot better, I think. Uh, so I, I have learned a lot, but I haven't learned, I can't say that I've learned too much about fluid dynamics. Yes? Have I looked at ink or pencil at all? Um, I have looked at both. Um, I like to, th there are some interesting uh, textures and patterns that you get out of ink and pencil. Um, kind of graininess, uh, with ink you get variations in the, the line thickness. Um, but usually what I study when I'm looking at ink and pencil is more about the imperfections and what happens when you draw something by hand. or or the way that if you're trying to draw some pattern by hand, uh, what, what's actually going on in your mind while you're doing that? So if you're trying to draw, say, a circle over and over again with a pen, what, what are the rules that, that are actually going on in your mind about how you correct the pen to keep it close to the circle? And can you recreate that uh, in a process? And, and can you capture that kind of mixture of randomness and intent. Um, and so I, I find that part of it a little bit more interesting than the specific textures of pen and pencil. Um, but uh, I would encourage you to investigate pen and pencil yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, question there. How long do your paintings uh, take to render? How long do the paintings take to render? Um, anywhere from um, a tenth of a second to uh, maybe one or two minutes at the high end. Uh, that depends a lot on uh, the polygon count and the line count. Um, the watercolor stuff is actually uh, infuriatingly slow um, because these polygons, uh, they end up with a lot of edges, and especially like this one, I think was close to a minute. I don't like, um, I don't like waiting quite that long uh, for pieces to, uh, to render. I try to keep things in the several seconds uh, range instead if I can. Uh, this gentleman right here. Yes. When do I think my work will pass a Turing test? Uh, yeah, I mean, translating the Turing test to artwork is, I mean, it is created by a human, right? So I hope I'm passing the Turing test in that aspect. Um, but uh, I do very frequently have people think that I've done this work by hand. Not, maybe not as much with the watercolor, although people do um, say that, but. 
especially with uh, line drawings by hand. So let me see if I can go back to, um, uh, I think it was this one. Yeah, so like the image on the left, a lot of people, even looking at a really large print up close, uh, they asked me, how long did it take you to draw this by hand? And uh, I told them I would be insane if I tried to do this by hand. Um, but that's what's cool, that's, wh that's what I love about trying to capture that, that kind of human warmth in, in the work, and that's what all that little carefully placed randomness gives you, is that, that uh, warm, natural feeling. So even though this is all triangles, ostensibly, uh, it has a, a much more natural, warm feeling. And so people do mistake it for being drawn by hand um, pretty often. Let me see how much time I've got. Yeah, there's a break after this too, so we've got plenty of time. Question back there, yes. Uh, the question is, um, the normal distribution is awesome and it's a good thing that I'm using it, but uh, have I thought about using other distributions? Um, so uh, the only other one that I, I tend to use is, um, boy, you put me on the spot, I'm uh, blanking on the name of it. Um, it's the one where uh, almost all of your values are very close uh, to, Poisson. yeah, like a Poisson distribution, exactly, yeah. Uh, man, that's a... That's a great audience. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I did take a probability class in, in um, university, and I remember, I, I loved it, and I remember there being a lot of uh, cool distributions, but uh, uh, that and uh, the, the triangle distribution has come in handy in, in a couple places. Um, but other than that, uh, normal distribution it works for me about 95% of the time, yeah. Uh, yeah, let me get I'll come back to you next time. Sorry. Yeah. Who are some other artists that we can like, take a look at if we're interested? Perfect question. Yeah, who are some other artists that you can take a look at uh, if you're interested? Um, so, uh, boy, there's a lot of them. So, so, probably the biggest name in generative artwork and one of the authors of uh, processing is a, is a gentleman by the name of Casey Reyes, R E A S. And uh, he's actually been pretty successful. In the, in the actual art world and convincing people to pay a lot of money for his artwork. Um, um, some of my favorites, um, there's a gentleman in Australia named uh, Jonathan McCabe who does um, his works on Flickr primarily, um, but it's, uh, he uses a lot of uh, cellular automata work that kind of recreates a lot of interesting biological patterns. Um, I would suggest looking at, there's actually uh, a generative art subreddit uh, that I'm a, a moderator on, um, R Generative, uh, and that actually has a really good sampling of, of lots of generative artists. Um, so if you want to see a good variety, that's, that's one spot that's actually one of the better collections on the internet of generative artwork. Um, yes, your turn. Sure. So the question is, um, obviously it's, it's hard to estimate because there's a lot of code reuse in my work, which is, is definitely true, but roughly how long does it take me to create a piece of artwork from, from sort of the start of the concept until the finished piece? Um, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of uh, variation in that. My typical range is probably five to ten hours. Uh, sometimes I get lucky and something good comes out in one hour. Um, sometimes it's a real grind and I work on it for 20 or 30 hours. And that's especially true if, if I'm doing something that's um, like a commission where I'm working back and forth with a client on a piece. Um, but it, generative artwork is really interesting in that way because sometimes these really elaborate, uh, detailed pieces uh, just come together really quickly and it only takes a few lines of code. And so. Um, it's, it's all over the place, whereas with something like a painting, um, you have a much more predictable amount of time, I think, that, that you're going to spend on a piece. So um, I, I love how fast I can work with generative artwork uh, most of the time. Um, all the way in the back. Yeah, you. Sure. So the question is, have I considered pairing um, audio synthesis 
uh, with the visual aspect of generative artwork. Um, I've considered it, uh, but for the same reason that I don't do animation, I, d I don't do that. Um, uh, it's, it, it makes it really difficult, uh, and I'm not quite there yet. And I also lose some of the control that I like. I like having uh, the control that having a sort of no input program gives you. I think there's a question over here. Have I thought about importing randomness from nature? Uh, I have not. Um, what's an example that you might think of? Now I'm curious. Yeah. OK, so like sampling a, f a photograph as a source of randomness. Uh, I have not thought about that. That might be an interesting way to get some really uh, unique probability distributions, though. So that's a cool idea. Yes, right beside you. Yeah. Kind of related question. Have you thought about um, providing your own randomness, like from, uh, say, kind of like a, like a webcam or uh, something like that? Yeah, have I considered providing my own randomness um, through some sort of uh, input, like uh, maybe keyboard or Wiimote or, or whatever? I've thought about it uh, maybe just briefly, but. Um, there weren't any huge advantages that stuck out to me. Um, I don't want to make things kind of interactive just for the sake of making people feel like they've had a meaningful input. Um, a lot of work that does that it feels kind of cheap to me, and I'd rather that they just made something cool without me waving a, a thing around. <laughs> That's how I feel. Uh, yeah, I had another question. Yeah, the question was, do I algorithmically uh, generate all of the shapes, or do I use SVG to import anything? Um, the answer is that I algorithmically generate, uh, in almost all of my pieces, 100% 100 of it. I, I, don't, um, I don't import any sort of geometric shapes. The closest thing that I can think of is, occasionally I will integrate um, hand-drawn elements, so digital painting elements. So if I want to do something like a generative portrait, um, then I will make, I will, I will integrate hand-drawn elements in it in various ways. Yes. Have I experimented with working in 3D but projecting it back into 2D? So anytime you look at a, a 3D image on your screen, it is naturally projected back into 2D. So I'm not sure about that part of it, but. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I do. I do all my computations in 2D. I don't do any uh, three-dimensional geometry or sort of perspective or anything like that. Sometimes I, I allude to three-dimensional elements, um, like this uh, one on the right. Uh, you might perceive some depth there, but um, no, all of my math is basically two-dimensional. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, uh, do I have the concept ready to go up front, uh, or do I kind of uh, work more iteratively? And, and the answer is that most often I'm working very iteratively, and it's very exploratory. Uh, and that's one of the strengths of the medium, is that it's so mutable. Um, you don't have to figure out everything up front. And, and any painter will tell you, even if you try to plan out a whole painting, and you do studies and sketches, when you go to paint the final painting, things don't work out and you have to adjust things on the fly. So it's, it's already difficult to plan things out perfectly. And, and so I find that um, I make the best work when I know very little up front about what I'm going to do and I just try to be open to see new things um, come out of the artwork. So time for one more question. Uh, who has the better question? Which, <laughs> this guy looks pretty confident. I'll talk to you afterwards. Yes, that's a question I like. This, I knew I went with this guy for a reason. Uh, the question is, if you purchase one of my works, do you get the source code too? The answer is yes. I provide a printout of the source code uh, to the works along with the prints. And all of my prints are uh, single edition works. I don't do multi-edition prints of anything. Um, 
Thanks, y'all, very much for all the great questions. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you.